Okay, folks, uh, why don't we get started tonight? Uh, my name is Alex Pavlak. I'm the program director for the uh, Chesapeake chapter. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming to our lecture this evening, and I want to thank Johns Hopkins for uh, uh, graciously providing these facilities for us. Uh, tonight, we're, uh, we're going to hear uh, Tej Luthra from IBM uh, talk to us about uh, uh, big data. It's a uh, topic that has many different dimensions and is uh, uh, a hot topic in very many areas. And uh, Tej will be providing us with a uh, overview that is uh, suitable for engineers. Uh, I want to remind everyone that the uh, lecture this evening is being broadcast live on YouTube. So that means uh, we're going to ask you all to hold your questions until the end. Uh, and at the end, we'll pass around a microphone so that the uh, folks on the internet can uh, hear the questions and hear the answers. So with uh, that out of the way, uh, one last plug for the green tickets. Anybody who doesn't have a green ticket, see Dave Aldridge. We have one here. Uh, you need a green ticket to uh, qualify for the raffle for understanding big data. OK, with that out of the way, uh, let's uh, get started. Tesh? Thank you, Alex. And uh, thank you very much, everyone, for having me here. Uh, my name is Tej Lutra, and I work with the IBM Big Data Division in, um, in technical sales. And um, my work kind of takes me around working with a lot of customers, architecting solutions for them, looking at uh, different ways of solving different kinds of problems. And I work very closely with research, with a lot of other uh, IBMers in understanding where the technology is going and where we are uh, helping our customers with getting to the next level. So today, I wanted to talk about not only just about big data, but kind of uh, talk about intelligence using the big data platform and how we have evolved from where we were before to where we are going in the future and how are we addressing the problems uh, that are coming along the way. So I want to focus around IBM's Cognitive and Analytical Security 360 paradigm. And uh, hopefully this gives an idea on um, the different aspects of this problem domain that we are trying to work with. Um, before we kind of get started, I wanted to do give this little disclaimer because a lot of the work that we do does come out from research uh, with working with customers with different clients in different situations. Uh, while some might still be concepts, others are fully baked in. Um, so I just wanted to kind of give this thing out that there might be some uh, different differences in uh, uh, what really comes out at the end uh, versus what I'm going to talk about today. So uh, starting out, uh, this was very interesting to me when I came across this uh, quote from Johnson and, uh, and Scholz about what really is strategic intelligence. And, uh, Regardless of the kind of analysis we do, or the strategic choices we make, or the outcome of those, cho those choices, they are all bound or glued by what the strategy is about. And that really defines what the intelligence or the, uh, the strategic intelligence of a nation is all about. And I think when we talk about big data, this really is par paramount in, in terms of understanding uh, what threats are we trying to resolve, how are we detecting them, and how are we staying ahead in the game in this paradigm? So talking about threats, um, they are plenty. And there are so many examples today that we have seen uh, take different forms. But kind of um, if we try to categorize them, they are essentially in the form of cyber crime, which could be a criminal activity using computers trying to hack into other systems and trying to gain access to that information. It could be categorized as espionage, where highly motivated groups of people or nations are trying to access certain pieces of information. And there could be a lot of motive behind it. It could be political. It could be commercial. It could be lots of other things. Um, likewise, terrorism and warfare are also not new, but they are really taking a different shape. And, it, and the problems really um, start growing exponentially when we see the different ways the threats kind of come about. And we talk in terms of you know, citizens hacking groups, uh, global multi multinationals, contractors, blackmailers. I mean, there are plenty of threats coming in from everywhere. And the methods are unique and different. And some are old school, some are new. But it is not only just cyber, but it is also 
physical, it's also analog. Uh, analog. For example, some of the ways that usually it happens is uh, using flash drives, where people actually walk from computer to computer trying to uh, take information out, trying to uh, sell this information out to different agencies, uh, whether within the country or outside. Um, likewise, there are other uh, you know, uh, things like what we've really come across uh, recently where we have lots of secure information, but we expose that information to very young people, and we have seen this information get leaked out as well. So you can see there are tons of methods. It's not just cyber oriented, but it, it actually does uh, go across in a lot of different dimensions. And the consequences are not uh, something that is new to us. We have actually seen this, but they are very critical to understand what the damage this kind of uh, breach can actually do. For example, um, Marine One, which is the president's helicopter, the engineering designs for that particular helicopter were found on a different country in a different system altogether, and which is essentially someone stealing away a very important piece of information. Uh, likewise, another example that we came across was uh, the, the quiet electric drive in submarines that was developed by the US Navy. And these designs actually turned out to be in a different country, either sold to different uh, you know, unique groups or being utilized by, by some other organization. And this is not only um, limited to government. In the commercial sector, we have seen different companies um, like banks, uh, uh, Google was one of the examples which has been a target. And speaking of target, target has been a target. So we have seen, <laughs> even in recent times, that no company is a word from espionage, from hacking, and from people can't, trying to gain access for either political reasons or for financial gains. And this is a very interesting chart. Uh, because it kind of talks about what's really happening today. It's not something that has happened five, ten years ago, but this really tells the, the gravity of the situation and how big it is growing. Uh, this report is produced by X-Force, which is part of uh, IBM. It's a research group within IBM. And they produce uh, these kind of uh, reports and papers uh, every year. And they have tons of documents and research papers that they keep producing. And they work very closely with different customers and different mission control managers. And um, they also do a lot of research around what the new threats are, where they are originating from, classifying them, uh, devising new pieces of technology that might be used to avert those kind of threats. And they, this is a very interesting chart, kind of summarizes what's happening, where we have all these different colored dots that are out there. These are known threats. These are threats that we have identified. Whereas if you look at the uncolored ones, these are undisclosed. These are threats that we had never known about before. And if we look at the timeline over the years of just a span of two years, it has really escalated. So the threat is even more paramount today than it was maybe a year or two years ago. And, um, and more systems are susceptible because of these undisclosed nature of these threats. So why exactly is that? And what is really changing? And we kind of look at three different aspects of how this has really become a big, bigger problem. One is definitely big data. And big data is not just data in large volumes. It's also data that is produced in high, in high degrees of frequencies, different kinds of data sets, mobile devices, cloud, which is essentially consumerization of IT. And these are some of these uh, methods or these uh, systems are unprotected or not protected enough so breaches are a lot easier. Each one of them, they present opportunities, challenges, and also risks around it. But this is the landscape that's changing today. And you know, we kind of think about that, yes, the landscape is changing, but what about analytics? Analytics should have changed too. Over the years, we have learned more about these systems. These are systems that we have developed, so obviously we should know more about how to manage these systems. And this is sort of a high level evolution chart of how analytics has grown within different, uh, you know, different organizations and different groups. Um, kind of looking back in time, you know, usually, and this is very true even today, a lot of it has been descriptive in terms of reports and dashboards. But essentially it is looking at some event that has happened in the past 
and we take a look at it and say, okay, we want to understand what really happened and how, was my how is the trend kind of looking at. And this is essentially a very conventional way of looking at things, which has sort of evolved into being more predictive, where we have some of the statistical analysis and predictive models in place, um, kind of answering the question, what will happen? You know, if something has happened in the past, maybe the trend can be understood to kind of predict the future and maybe take some action on it. And that's where prescriptive comes into place, which is advanced analytics. You know, what should we do about it? Should we control, put some more controls on our systems? Uh, can we make some better sales, depending on uh, maybe the sentiments that we kind of come across? And um, if we look at these three, you know, it really brought in something called a correlation. And these correlations weren't necessarily accurate. We would come across with these really fancy correlations saying, hey, you know, how do I sell more pens and pencils to people who chew them? And there were 14% in that corpus of data that basically chewed the pencil because they didn't have a name or greeting on the voicemail. It's a really bad correlation, you know, but it's a correlation. And that's where it really came out from these predictive and prescriptive um, methods of doing analytics. So what really is changing is moving to the cognitive uh, paradigm. And that's where we are getting smarter over time. We are trying to learn. The system learns the way it evolves. And it's all because of the way the big data is being uh, presented to it. And when we talk about big data, there are essentially four Vs that we talk about. Uh, volume, variety, velocity, which typically is very common uh, when we talk about big data. These three Vs, uh, three Vs usually do come out very um, um, in most of our discussions. But the most important one is about confidence in the data. You know, do we really trust it? Do we govern it? Do we secure the data enough to understand and make most of this big data? And that's where cognitive really comes into play because now using system learning uh, methods, we can actually ask questions in a more subjective way and the system can understand and give predictions uh, based on its learning over time. Okay, so, so that's about a high level on you know, where we are, where we are going and what really has happened. I wanted to kind of uh, take the discussion more into a you know, security paradigm where we see an actual threat where we actually come across a use case where we understand how this is really impacting us in day-to-day -day life. And these are things that we commonly do every day. Sometimes we recognize them, sometimes we don't. But then this kind of gives an idea on uh, the extent of the damage when a system is totally unprotected. This is like a worst case scenario that can ever happen. So let's examine a company called GATCOM. And GATCOM essentially is a company, oh, I'm sorry, wrong button is a fictitious global aerospace traffic command center. And what they really do is uh, manage the aerospace routing and warning and analytics for US and Canada. So all the satellites that are moving over the country, any uh, near Earth movement that happens, all those uh, maps and charts and directives are with GATCOM. And the attack scenario is that we want to see how this company can be breached and what are the different ways the companies are breached and, and what do hackers really do when they start getting access to the system within and how do they plant malware and how do they kind of go from one place to another to, to get more information out from the system. But remember, this is a worst case scenario. It doesn't really have to happen this way, but this kind of gives you a full picture. And <clears throat> so let's take our subject, Bob, and I hope there's no Bob in here, but if there is, this is just fictitious. The idea behind Bob is that hackers are typically looking for a target. And they need to acquire the target to start the intrusion attack, to kind of understand what really they can do with this target to gain access to this, uh, this system or this company to get the information that they really want. And remember that any, any kind of hackerism or any kind of intrusion attack is not really a spur of the moment thought. It really is months and months in planning and they spend a lot of time understanding who the targets are. They try to build profiles around those targets. And there could be more than one, potentially more than one target for every company that they're targeting. And there could be more than one companies too. So all they're trying to do is understand what Bob is doing day in, day out, and kind of find a vulnerability when Bob presents to them where they can actually go into the system and then try and hack it. In this case, we're going to 
we, can, we will use social networking as one of the ways in which the hackers can actually gain access to the system. So let's see how do they do that. So Bob is waiting at the airport and um, he is on an unprotected network, a public Wi-Fi. And uh, when he logs there, he sends, he basically logs into his GATCOM system and um, you know, logs in and basically tries to do certain things and then basically goes on and logs into Twitter or Facebook and, and other places uh, and just goes about doing things because he's, you know, at the airport and he has a time to do certain things. So, you know, business and, and whatever personal emails he wants to do, uh, he does that. But that little action gives the hackers an opening right there. They know that he's on a protected, unprotected network and uh, it's unsecured and they can probably potentially gain access to what he's trying to do. So once Bob sends a tweet out to, from his personal email account, um, they, they pretty much know that yes, there is a profile that they have built around and now they know that Bob has given them an opening where they can actually start getting into their system just because that's a public Wi-Fi system. And remember, there's no endpoint protection. It's a very, you know, a, a worst case scenario, if you will. So once that happens, now the tweet triggers an alert and the hackers now, they, what they start doing is uh, they try to understand uh, what this person is now trying to do. This is an opening for them. They have to really take advantage of this opening. So they, they devise a spear phishing attack, which is essentially um, like a cross-site scripted code that they need to deploy so they can then install Trojans and other malware so that they can start extracting information, personally identified information about the person or maybe uh, steal username passwords. So now since they know what Bob's profile is, and they also know that, um, that he does actually like Washington Nationals and, and so on and so forth, so they kind of understand what you know, he's trying to do, um, they try to send him a Facebook message after some time, saying, hey, how about you join the Washington National, National Fan Club? Now what happens is that when Bob logs back into this open Wi-Fi network and looks at this, um, this request on his Facebook page, unknowingly, obviously, since he likes uh, uh, nationals, obviously, he can go in and, you know, probably most potentially, he can go and say, yes, I'm going to see what there is in it, and maybe go and like the page and become a member. Action, what really happens is that the URL takes him to a dead site, and there's nothing in there but just a background uh, GFE. Uh, uh, there's a persistent cross-site scripting, XXX vulnerability that gets exposed, and that uh, Trojan basically uh, installs a little software on his device, which can then start extracting any information that he types on his, on his device. So what really happens is that when the next time he logs into his company uh, portal, GATCOM, using his single sign-on, now the hackers, using that XXS uh, code, they can basically latch on to this SSO user ID password, and now they can extract that information from him. So now, since they have this information, they have now breached that first level of security and at least get into the network at some point. You know? So maybe it's further protected down, but they at least have you know, gone through the first firewall. So now, using Bob's uh, credentials, they deploy sniffer programs. And they start sniffing into what kind of network he's trying to get into, what is the server, uh, what information he's trying to gather, and so on and so forth. And these are very high sophisticated uh, you know, sniffer programs that can actually go in and understand a lot of the pieces of information. So it's not that they are just sitting or coding or you know, doing things on the spur. These are well-defined programs which potentially our security personnel also use, but it's, it's along the same lines. So now what they have really gotten is uh, they have established now communication channels back to their home base, and now they have access to the GATCOM's servers, and they understand what the network is doing within. Now the second thing what they do is they try to find high value targets within the network, which could potentially be a set of servers, I'm sorry, a set of servers uh, identified by DCA, NYC, L SLC, which potentially look like servers where most traffic is going from, or there are some, you know, uh, uh, these could be some that are sitting within the network that can actually give them more access to other places. So they, ha they will go ahead and enslave these three different servers and start expanding their footprint 
by installing special Trojans and malware on these servers. And all these malwares have to do is basically try and sniff through the packets that are going in so they can start extracting information from them. And these are very similar to botnet attacks or different kinds of uh, DNS amplification type of attacks. And these could be a lot, I mean, the purposes could be many. But the method of kind of getting into the system could potentially be somewhat similar. So now, basically, phase one is complete for the hackers. So by the time Bob lands, what they have really been able to do is they have gathered credentials, they have planted malware, enslaved the network assets, and established hooks and backdoors. So they can basically come in and go out of the system without being detected because they have a perfect ally to go in who doesn't really know that he has exposed uh, the company's network. So now, once they have gained access to these servers with these malwares, the, ta the, ne the next task is to gather data and enslave the minions, or gather the minions, in a way. So, so what they're really trying to do is, in slow, um, very you know, brief moments of time, they will try to extract or bleed the information over a longer period of time. So potentially not getting detected um, and still be able to get the information out. And this will go on and on and on, uh, slowly over a long period of time, because there's less chance of being detected. And lo and behold, after maybe a year or six months or so, the news comes out that the company's uh, assets or intellectual property or classified documents have been stolen. And it shows up on the news that somehow these helicopter engineering designs or this company's engineering designs have shown up at some place or other. And this is huge for the company itself because not only it brings their reputation down, it is also a, a huge loss to the company as well. And for high value targets like government where we have lots of classified information and missions, this is really bad. So, so this is a typical way or one of the ways where um, networks are breached. And we all use social media and we all use uh, unsecure network. And most of the time, the networks do pop up saying, hey, you are trying to get into an unsecure network, so be careful. But we still get into it. And that's where you know, this advent of newer technologies are coming in where we are susceptible to these kind of attacks without n having knowledge about that they are actually happening to us. So in summary, when we look at it, there are, there are lots of challenges that we come across. So threats are emerging at a higher rate. It's harder to detect, and there's a high cost of prevention. So not every company who is putting up a cloud service is actually protecting their cloud because there's a huge cost associated with it. And if you look at what the hackers are doing, they are persistent. They have devised new methods to get in. And they have tons of backdoors uh, mechanisms to actually get into their systems and try and gather the information. So, so when we, we want to protect this environment, there are some key questions that we need to ask. And these questions are very basic questions. But they really give us a very rounded understanding of how we need to protect end to end whether it be a network or any infrastructure that we have. The first question is, do I have sensitive data? And where is the sensitive data? How do I need to protect it? How do I secure a rep repository? Or how do I even assess that there is a repository that has sensitive data or piece of information that I need to protect? The next is that if I do have some information and it's moving across the network, can I mask it? Can I encrypt the data? So there is little chance of losing the data or there's one less potential chance of losing the data if a breach does happen or the data does get lost. The next question is, that: do I have a good identity and management process? So the three A's of uh, gaining access is um, you, authorize, you authorize, you access, and um, you authenticate, basically. Once you get authenticated, you gain access to it, or you get authorized, and then you get access to it. So, so that's really important. And then once people start gaining access to this information, what we really do want to know is on an ongoing basis, you know, are we monitoring it? Do we have ways to go back and say, hey, we know exactly what happened, what the footprint was. There was a breach, but this was really the path that was taken. And can we quarantine or block unauthorized access? Being a super user, I do have access to a lot of information, but then do I, you know, can I just break into the system and start getting pieces out? Or can I be blocked at a point where the system understands that this is somewhere that this person is not 
uh, authorized to go beyond a certain point. So when we start looking at this, it's, it's really a supply chain again, where we are trying to answer certain questions on discover, harden, mask, monitor, and block. And how do we really put it together? Is by proper security policies, entitlements, uh, understanding where the dormant data is, data that's not used, and it's a perfect case for archival. And do I have compliance reporting and security alerts in place? And last but not the least, do I have data protection and enforcement for it? So, um, any questions so far? Yes. On your last slide, when you say block, if they have um, you know, tempted and oh. you know... Uh, let's wait for the... Uh... On the last slide, when you say block, um, if there's a suspicion that this is a unfriendly source, could they then have an alternative to, say, trap, so they can just lead them on and then try to find out uh, who it is? Um, it really depends on how, <clears throat> how the system is architected. Um, the system does give you the capability to circumvent and uh, direct the traffic to maybe some sort of a dummy data. So you can still kind of track the packets and IPs where it's coming from. Um, and I'll probably talk about this a little bit later down where we are actually looking at lots of different ways of doing it. Um, and I'll probably talk about some examples on when a system admin who has all the access to the data now suddenly goes rogue and he's trying to access information. But yes, you could direct it. You could stop right, them, you know, right there on the tracks, and you could do a lot of things with it, and it's very fluid. I mean, it's a, it's a framework that really depends on you know, your, kind of, your requirements that you present over there or the security officer presents. Okay, so let's look at some of the, uh, it's, I would not say shortcomings, but some of the limitations of what we have been doing in the past. So now we do know that there are, there's a data store that we see on the right, and essentially what an attack is that we are trying to gain access to this and trying to get this information out from it. Now when an attack really happens or when somebody tries to do an intrusion into our systems, it's usually a footprint. It's usually some sort of a pattern that's trying to go in and take information out. Now in some, in, in traditional signature based solutions, we can block these intrusion attempts uh, only if we know the attack pattern. So if I know that this particular IP is coming in from this location or it's out of the country, maybe I can, I can block it. I can do something about it. And so it's, it's a, it's a rule-based approach in a way. So I can allow traffic that is in green to go to let it through, but then I can start blocking these, uh, the red ones, where I know that there is some sort of a pattern that's, that's disallowing them to go in. But if I do not know the pattern, if I do not know the rule, or if I haven't really devised that rule, there could be a chance that something could go in. And this is usually what happens in, um, in fast flux kind of attacks where uh, there are tons of IPs and tons of domains and there is no pattern to it and they just kind of keep you know, bombarding the system with lots of requests and very little packets and it's very hard to detect whether it's an intrusion attack or whether it's a normal traffic coming in. So, so this is one of the you know, limitations around uh, traditional signature based solutions. So what's really changing is that we're trying to get into this cognitive cyber defense kind of an approach where the system learns uh, from its past and from some training models if you will and uh, trying to build out a space where all these uh, requests that are coming in, they are fed into this cognitive model. And this is essentially what learns uh, what the system is really doing. Uh, think about Netflix, you know, so there was a time when maybe a few people watched movies online, but then certainly for the next five years or 10 years, 50% of Amazon's bandwidth and 50% of any ISP's bandwidth was taken up by uh, by Netflix, uh, you know, by movies that were being run there. So if we, if we look at it in a different way, it's high volume coming in, it's a different pattern that's coming in, but can the system really understand that this is normal pattern or is it something that's an anomaly? Is it, DNS, is it a DNS amplification attack? You know, who knows? So those are the kind of things cognitive cyber defense kind of looks into and maybe in the next slides I kind of walk you through the actual algorithm, some of the you know, specifics around what we're trying to do with this. So, <clears throat> how we really kind of deploy it, so I'm gonna, t gonna take it from the top down. Um, once we've defined the models, and we know what kind of things we wanna track, and we, we've trained the models enough, and it's an ongoing process, 
Um, we want to inject that model where the data flow is happening. And in this case, we'll, we're looking at streams computing. So let's say there's a streams process that's bringing in data from different channels. And the channels could be coming, pointing to different telemetry devices like RFIDs or Wi-Fi's, or they could be traditional data sources uh, where all this data is coming in, but they're all coming in in different channels. Now, as it's coming in, I want to plug this model right where the data is being accessed, whether it's coming in or going out, so I know exactly what kind of data it is, whether it's a request coming in or there is somebody trying to take pieces of information out. And once this is, this is plugged in here, I need to do some sort of an action on it. And that's the dashboard that comes with this whole paradigm of this whole solution where I can now take all this information, all these alerts, and put them on a triage where I can then make educated decisions on what I really need to do with these, uh, with these alarms. Do I need to investigate? Do I need to let them go? Or can the system basically learn on its own and, and resolve the alarms uh, that are shown in red over here because it's how the system is actually evolving over time. So these are some of the things on how to actually go and deploy this in a system where it can actually manage a lot of traffic. The other interesting aspect, um, and there are a lot more, I just kind of wanted to cover two of them because I think they, they speak to a, a majority of the use cases. The other very important thing that's happening with, uh, with big data is the use of the Hadoop technology. And it's a low cost storage and distributed computing platform that can run a massive number of servers and you can run massive amount of code and um, at a very low cost. So every uh, company in the world is trying to take, make use of this technology and they're deploying it enterprise wide. But with this new technology, there are lots of loopholes that are coming in. There is inadequate security that's out there. Maybe sometimes people do not implement security for various reasons. Um, or there are loopholes. So every technology has a vulnerability that really exposes it out for attacks. And Hadoop is no, you know, it's, it's not alien to that. So essentially how this really works is, um, if I want to monitor what's really happening on my Hadoop cluster or a big data cluster, I want to be able to do some sort of an assessment, kind of find out how risky the system is um, so it can tell me exactly what I need to do to harden it, to protect it, to stick it, to understand whether the system is really hardened and secure uh, to do my normal day-to-day -day business. I also would like to do some activity monitoring and understand um, who is trying to access the data? Can I have an audit log around it? Can I, when auditors come in and ask for certain things, can I really bring out a lineage saying, hey, this is how the data kind of moved and this is where uh, this information was asked for? And if the data is at rest or in motion, can I encrypt the data? Um, and in terms of master data and redaction, those are other kind of components that really come in. So if you can see, this is like a whole rounded requirements around hardening uh, the big data environment or a Hadoop cluster. And one of the components that we use in, um, is, is a collector and some software taps that sit on the Hadoop nodes, which actually start understanding what kind of activity is really happening, whether I'm trying to access an edge-based data store, what kind of columns I'm trying to look for, or if I'm running a MapReduce job, or if I'm trying to do something else, it will keep monitoring and understanding who has the entitlements to actually go and is this process authorized to run over there or not. So in real time, it can send alerts, it can block people, and this is going back to your question on if I have a case where someone's trying to do something bad, can I stop him or can I redirect the traffic? And this is where I would put in a policy saying, I know that there is an intrusion attack happening and I want to get more information out of it, let's re redirect the traffic to somewhere else, either using a different router or something, so I can keep continuing that attack, but I can then find out, get more evidence uh, in terms of the source and what the ramification should be. Okay. So, so far it's like kind of high level. We talked about, you know, what's really happening and the space is really big. I mean, w when we look at the different kinds of attacks, I kind of listed some of them here. Uh, denial of service, whether they are viruses or DNS amplification, and very important is the customer identifiable data. These are all really big anomal anomalies that happen today in almost all network systems, whether it be data, whether it be just telemetry devices or wherever um, there is data movement, uh, these are some of the very important problems that happen. So how do we really define an anomaly is the question. And in a network anomaly, it's some sort of a deviation from some traffic characteristics that are happening. So I know that this is a normal trend, but then there is something different 
uh, that's happening, and it's, it's supposedly an anomaly. It is short-lived and it's very rare, and sometimes it's never been seen before. It could be some new way of hacking the system, uh, but that's really an anomaly. And sometimes it could be accidental or deliberate. And what the system really needs to do in anomaly detection is it should be in real time and network wide. And the key is that it should have little or no prior knowledge that this attack is actually happening. And one of the examples is probably on the next slide. Yes, over here. And I'll explain why it happens. And this really kind of boils down into what kind of model that we try to use uh, to do that. And um, cat categorically speaking, it's, it's sort of in two little buckets here an unsupervised learning model and a supervised learning model. In an unsupervised model, we essentially try to uh, give the system enough information so it can keep learning on its own and then detect where the problems are occurring and then adjust um, its corpus and its domain based on what it really learns. And this is very good in terms of when we have very few, in very little pieces of information of when things are good but there is potentially a very large number of negatives or ways that things can really go wrong or bad. And think about an aircraft engine um, where there are tons of ways it can go bad and there are tons of ways that we don't know how it can go bad. And we know for a few ways that it can actually uh, be really good. So the ratio, you can see the difference is really huge. So, so this is a very good example of where unsupervised learning has a um, really good benefit of implementation. Network attacks, again, they are very good you know, uh, candidate for this kind of implementation. And the basis of unsupervised learning is that there is no error or reward signal. It doesn't really come back and tell you, hey, really, this is a red flag. This is you know, something else. You need to do something about it. it, you know, it there is no indication as such. So if a human is kind of looking at it, you can potentially understand what it is, but sometimes you could, it could probably slip through. So looking at the supervised approach, these are essentially trained models. And think of them as documents. And documents are it's, uh, unstructured pieces of information. And what my goal is to understand what this document is about. I need to understand parts of speech. I need to understand the structure of the document. I need to understand what this document really intends to do. An example could be email spams. Or I have some other you know, document processing in terms of text analytics that I'm trying to do. So what I'm doing is I'm annotating certain fields. I'm building up a dictionary. I'm also looking at um, entity extractions in a way that whether is this an actual name of a person and is this an actual location or is there something to that document that I can go back and say, well, this really defines some sort of an entity that I know about. But what I'm really doing is that I have a small piece of data set and I, I have labeled it Maybe all of it, or maybe part of that, maybe a subset of that data set that I have, but I've labeled some of it. And this is essentially going to drive the rest of the corpus. So once I've trained the data and I understand how the classification is and how the data is kind of laid out, now I can let this model run on my entire system. So as and when new documents come in, as and when email spams come in, I'll, now I have the capability to go in and understand why this document and what does this document really contain. And email spam is a perfect example and lots of our customers like Constant Contact, they process about 40 to 50 billion emails every year. This is a great way of how they can actually understand whether the email was really a success or not and whether, you know, uh, what they can really do to understand uh, consumer behavior around emails. So, but for each one of them, as compared to when there's no reward or signal on the left, there is always a supervisory signal that comes on the right. Kind of tells you, yes, in this location, I find this particular entity and it looks like a date to me and you know it is a date but the date could be in different forms it could be December it could be 12 it could be you know something or the other maybe it's kind of uh, handwritten in cursive um, but the supervised models are strong enough their algorithms are strong enough to kind of understand the real power comes in when we combine both of them together where we have systems which are not only learning as it goes along but then we also attached these models, the trained models, to get more information about what the system is actually trying to do. In lots of banking customers that we worked with, one of the major problems, and this is very common, it's about insider threat. And this is a paramount problem because 60% of all hacks kind of happen some way or the other because of some anomaly that happened in, internally. And 
what companies really are trying to do is, one, obviously they, they want to understand the network, they want to understand whether there are bots and malware and other viruses installed in their systems, but they also want to monitor the activity of individuals in the company. So they do try to build profiles around what is the normal behavior of this person, what entitlements they have, what is their path of going to certain websites, browsing sites, uh, internal document stores, and so on and so forth. Now if they have that kind of a pattern, now they can understand what might be an anomalous behavior when this person is on a coffee break or maybe after hours and suddenly they see a large volume of data being downloaded on that account. And now they can now, at that trigger, they can go back to the second level saying, let me understand what kind of data is being extracted. Is it a high value target or maybe if it's a bank, maybe they're trying to uh, download information about uh, their high value customers. Or if it's an insider, you know, uh, in terms of you know, classified documents, what kind of documents are being taken out? So this classifier really helps and augments what an unsupervised learning model can actually trigger at one end, and this can actually start remediating or actually find more information on what this person is actually trying to do. So, so that's a high level on you know, what is the difference between both of them and what kind of anomaly detection is versus supervised learning. So fast flux is one um, anomaly that we, uh, it has really become, and I'll probably only talk about one, but there are so many of them, like DNS amplification and others, but I want to talk about just fast flux for now. But if you need more information on how we kind of address the other kind of threats, I can definitely you know, talk about that at some other point, or you can send me an email. Uh, but kind of just going over what a fast flux is, that you have in a network, you kind of come across tons of IPs uh, that are assigned to a single domain or multiple domains. And usually what hackers do is they switch the IPs and DNS at a very rapid rate. Thousands and thousands get uh, generated in a very short period of time. So to a normal network uh, uh, detection system, it kind of looks like that it's normal traffic. But behind the scenes, they are actually trying to gain access to information through different IPs and trying to pull pieces of information out a little bit at a time so it kind of goes under the covers and not be detected. It's like flying below the radar and just kind of getting to your destination. And this is essentially what, what fast flux is. And um, using cognitive, we can identify those kind of domains which are, you know, which are showing some sort of a fast fluxing nature. And we have done a uh, lot of work in research and also with some customers where we have been able to um, use a predictive blacklisted domain name list that we have and run the cognitive uh, cyber defense on top of using those blacklisted, and we have been able to find even more DNSs um, in that corpus of data that were potentially dangerous. And so this is, this is really one of the biggest problems uh, that are out there. And how this really works is that, um, so let's say there's a client making a request to the DNS resolver and goes into the DNS pool, and the request comes back, and the person basically gets access to uh, the system through a tap. And the, the detector basically is trying to understand whether this is a true um, request or is it something, an anomaly, or some sort of an anomaly that's being detected. And at that point, it would either gain, give them access to whatever document they were looking for, or they would trap it and put it on the ad hoc collector and put it down for reporting or maybe terminate the connection and take it out. So depending on what your remediation methods are. But this is like a, a very high level view of how and where this would be placed on your network. And talking about um, supervised learning, I wanted to spend you know, the major part of this uh, talk on, on this particular algorithm, which has been implemented in a lot of ways in our, uh, in our different um, product sets. And this is the kernel-based online anomaly detection or code. Co-add, I think, co-add. So what really this is, that it's a real-time anomaly detection algorithm. And essentially, it tries to build a dictionary of input vectors. Input vectors are your data sets that are coming in. And these, this directory is ever-changing. So it's not that you, know, you have to sort of put some keywords in the directory. It's, it's evolving as it senses that the network traffic is, uh, is OK or it's not OK. And essentially, what really happens is that it, then it defines a region of normal behavior. So it knows that anything that happens within the space is normal, and anything that kind of goes out needs attention. Could be a flag, could be something that I need to investigate on. But the dictionary basically adapts over time, and, um, and as time goes by, it also kind of evolves to the nature of the business. 
and at some point in time it does some exponential cleaning. So very old dictionary items or very old data sets are not really that impacted by uh, what's really happening in the system today. So there's a little effect like a weight that kind of goes down with it. Um, but this is kind of a high level definition of how it's, you know, if you open up what it really means, that's what it is. But behind the scenes, what, um, what it really relies on is, is something like this. And you can read the paper down uh, by Tarim Ahmad uh, et al. And it really explains in detail on how this algorithm is actually, how it actually functions. And in here, I've kind of put in a few high level items that kind of gives you an idea on how this, is, this has been implemented. Um, as a background of COAD, it's a kernel trick. And the kernel trick essentially is that if we have a kernel function that can be applied to a set of input vectors, and they map to a feature space, which is this uh, kind of a, like a space in, in space time, like a two-dimensional space, uh, which basically tells me whether the, the product of these different features coming in, or these different input vectors coming in, whether they can lie within that region or not. And what the benefit of this algorithm is that it doesn't really need to know what the features are about. It learns by itself what those feature spaces are and how it needs to adjust to them. And that's the, that's the whole idea behind uh, the least square method that this algorithm actually uses. So what really happens is that this is the kernel function, which is a part of these two feature, uh, feature spaces. And this is the kernel trick which says that any event that's happening at i, time i, it belongs to that larger set of products or that larger data set. And, and what I'm really doing is I'm trying to apply this, this function to it to find a, a delta error, a projection error, if you will. And this, if this projection error is less than a threshold, then I know that this event is OK, that it's not a breach, it's not something wrong. But if it is not, then I need to take certain actions. But this is just the base of the algorithm. It's not the actual implementation. And in the middle, what you see is the dictionary space and the feature space of the data element that's coming in. So if xi or xt is the data element that's coming in at time t, the psi xt is my feature space for that data element. And what I really want to do is how far apart from my dictionary is it? Is it really within the dictionary or is it really out? And that tells me whether it's below the threshold or not. And all these ver different values are computa computed in real time. So the dictionary evolves over time. Your data elements that come in, they evolve over, over time. And that defines whether it is an anomaly or not. So in COAD, what really happens is a four-step process that we define two thresholds, v1 and v2. Uh, v1 is a lower threshold, which basically defines where my dictionary kind of ends. And v2 is where my anomaly is really bad. And I know that definitely something that happens beyond v2 is a red flag that I really need to look at. But anything that happens within v1 and v2 is my scope of learning. And once it figures that out, it needs to evaluate my measurement. So as and when my data sets are coming in at time t, t plus 1, t plus 2, what it's trying to do is understand this, measure it against the dictionary, and raise a red flag if it goes beyond v2, or raise an orange alarm if it is within v1 and v2. And if it's below, v, below v1, then obviously it's within the dictionary space, and it just kind of goes in there. So once it does find a red alarm, obviously it's a direct stop and it knows that this is an event that is flagged out. But then if it's an orange alarm, it really needs to learn about it. So it comes back after maybe some, uh, some different time step. Let's say the first event happened at t. After t plus l time steps, it'll go back and revisit this alarm. And if that alarm is still there, then it'll flag it as a red. But if the alarm is, if we are able to resolve, because at that time the dictionary has evolved as well, because the system has learned that this is a new pattern of traffic that's coming in, and it's OK, then this alarm would be degraded back to being normal. And at that point, the dictionary would go back and say, OK, I've learned a little bit more about the system, and now I can let it be, and I can you know, resolve this and move forward. And then, over the course of time, it starts cleaning up the dictionary as well. So my space of dictionary kind of remains consistent. It doesn't really grow exponentially. So from a computation standpoint, from, uh, from a storage standpoint, it's not really you know, too big. And all my processing is only on the data element. And it's kind of an M, 
uh, kind of an, um, like a two by two vector, if you will. So pictorially speaking, this is how it is implemented. Um, this is shown in a two-dimensional graph, so it kind of gives a better understanding of how this algorithm is implemented. But behind the scenes, there are multi-dimensions in terms of what really happens in every data step, and, and uh, there's more detail around it. But this kind of explains very well on how, how this is. So if you look at the first one over here, there are three different bands, if you will. The internal one is the space that is normal, which is within the dictionary space, and everything is linear over there. So all the uh, data elements coming in, they map to the dictionary element and everything is linear and everything is resolvable. Right there, it's common traffic. This space is within my V1 and V2. This is where there is a potential of an anomaly coming in. But then what I have is I need my system to learn whether this anomaly is something that I need to look at. And anything beyond this corpus is definitely an alarm. So kind of looking at the algorithm's uh, pseudocode, what happens is that the first step is we define v1 and v2. And v1 and v2 are usually defined by the known, in supervised learning, we usually have a known set of uh, positives, which is my data that is good and data that is functions well. So I can derive my, my threshold based on that. And when I'm training the model, I can understand you know, what my v1, v2 can be, and then I can start adjusting it, and then let it be on the system. So now, for every time step, one, two, three, and four, I need to loop through because I have data elements coming in. And as and when these data elements come in, my first step is to evaluate the current measurement. That the data that's coming in, whether it's okay or not. The first thing is I compute the projection error, which is delta t at time t, and I look for whether it's greater than v2. If it's higher than v2, it's lying outside this orange outside bar, um, um, outside this, this orange space. And definitely it's a red alarm. But if it's between v1 and v2, then it's an orange alarm. And I want to add that particular element to D because I need the dictionary to learn as well because this is going to come back again. Is it going to look for something? But then I always uh, keep track of, of this orange alarm because I need to resolve it at some point. It's not resolved yet. But it's lying down here in between. That's how it kind of gets in, but it's a question mark because I don't know what it is. If not, if none of these are uh, true, then definitely delta or the projection error is less than my lower threshold and that's a green light. And I don't need to change the dictionary because what the dictionary really gave me is true. So I, I don't want to do that. But now the second, the sort of the third step happens. The first step is obviously this and two step. The third step is to process the previous orange alarm. So I keep looking at it. Um, first alarm happens at T, then I look maybe a few time steps forward, maybe L time steps forward. So if I'm looking at maybe a minute 20, then I'm looking at minute 100 to see if that alarm is still out there, or maybe even in the future if it comes about. So what I'm doing is I'm finding the usefulness of x t plus l. So is the data packet coming in after t plus l, which has the same signature, does it really uh, represent another uh, red alarm, or whether it's, in, whether it's in, uh, you know, still kind of an OK alarm or, or, or an orange alarm? So if the useful, usefulness is not correct, which means that if my kernel products over the time steps, so t, t1, t2, t3, 2, tl, if my kernel products are not linear, then it means that it is an anomaly. This element that's coming in, x plus t, uh, sorry, uh, x, t plus l, is an anomaly because my, my, um, uh, my, uh, the products of my linear, of my kernel, uh, pro the kernel element, I'm sorry, <laughs> It's not linear enough. So that way, what happens is that it devices, it, it, it marks this as an alarm, red 2. So it promotes this as a, as, a, as a red alarm and removes what I did put in in the dictionary, that old element, and I take it out from the dictionary. Because now I know that this is, this is an anomaly. I don't need to put it in the dictionary. It's not going to be a green alarm. Otherwise, if it is linear, if my product of my kernel is linear, then I need to lower this as an orange. And the last step that I need to do is I need to uh, well put this back into the dictionary. It's already there in this step. But then I need to find the usefulness of the dictionary elements. So again, I do the product of my uh, kernel elements. And I try to see whether it's still linear. And if it's not, then I kind of remove it. So coming back to what's really happening here is when I'm processing the previous alarm, it turns it red. But if it is OK, if it's an orange, 
this is what really happens. It turns it green, this is the orange alarm, but then it, it makes the dictionary space larger now at this point. Because now my system has learned, it has understood that this is a new pattern which is normal, it's coming in, it's not a threat, it's not an anomaly. So this is the basis of how that uh, algorithm is actually implemented within. Now kind of giving you an example of how this maps to real life. Let's say we have two pictures at two different times. This is time step uh, T and this is time step T plus L. This is an, an image that's coming in and there's another image that is taken after that some time and you can see obviously that there is a, a person in here and that's an anomaly. So what I need to look for is whether this anomaly is true or not. I probably might look at the time that this is during normal business hours, it's okay. Or maybe it's someone else who, maybe it's a security guy coming in making rounds, but then I need to know whether the person actually tagged and there is a footprint left by the security guard saying I'm, I'm actually on my rounds and I've been through all these locations. Or it could be someone who's just kind of invading the privacy, it's a physical threat coming in. So this is, this is exactly one example of how this algorithm can be used to determine whether it's normal traffic or whether it is bad traffic. So what we do is, that image itself, we need to render it down to its vectors because that's how I'm going to understand my data set. I need to change this into uh, some sort of a canny image detector and then kind of extrapolate the frequencies of how this is happening so I can build my, my vectors and my dimensions and then I can start making products and then try to find whether it's linear to the dictionary or whether it's different. And you can see when I try to do the product, I can definitely see that there is something missing here but then there is something here. So I know there is an anomaly that's coming in. So this really, this is you know, somehow that how you could potentially take something, an example like this, and use that algorithm to, to make certain that, you know, there is some sort of uh, problem that's coming in. So this one I put in together, uh, just wondering if I had time or not. Um, am I okay? Five more minutes? Okay, I think I'm almost, maybe I'll skip this, but this is on uh, context on, on document you know, analysis. If I want to mine the document and see what its context is about, do entity extraction, something like you know, the, um, the customer information uh, that I was trying to extract, like an insider threat or something. This is an example of that. So that brings me to probably the last two slides in analytical security 360. What is that? I mean, this is not a product. It's, it's actually a flexible uh, multi-technology solution framework that is really built around what need, needs to be done for mission commanders to protect the system, to understand what CISO's requirements are uh, around putting, deploying powerful preventive network defenses to monitor the action and build preventive measures for you know, previous attacks or, or any future potential attacks. So, and what we're really utilizing is the deepest industry uh, you know, technology so we can give them to the mission commanders to be able to deploy in their systems. And if you look at it, Holistically, it covers everything. We talked about endpoint management, so the mobile device that was susceptible to breach, that's one of it. Access control, blocking, anomaly detection, network traffic control. This brings out every aspect of security in terms of even remediation and enforcement, mask masking and encryption. So depending where the threat is, where the vulnerabilities are, this solution can actually go and help you build or strengthen what you really have. So it's not a strip and replace, but it's how do you augment, how do you kind of utilize the best of breed uh, information that's available, knowledge that's available, algorithms that are actually being very fruitful and being used in industry, how can we, how can we protect the environment or the, the infrastructure. So with that, I think that was the last slide in the questions. Actually, before we get started with the questions, uh, if you don't have a green ticket yet for the book giveaway, just please raise your hand. And uh, Dave, you have the ticket bucket? Thank you so much. Any questions on this side of the room? Questions over here? Oh, well, your last example uh, related to um, image processing and uh, scene change detection. So have you, you know, looked at, you know, the different ways of uh, the scene change detection rather than, you know, what you gave an example of how you're doing the processing. Now you also use that, I guess, in intelligent transportation systems. That's a huge journal of, from the IEEE, you know, many different ways of uh, doing things. So I was just wondering, um, you know, how you came about uh, with a fast and efficient method. Yeah, so uh, yes, there have been a lot of deployments in this and uh, 
I don't have details on the MPEG uh, resolution processes that we use behind the scenes, but there have been use cases where we've tried to uh, classify the data. For example, when we are trying to understand whether uh, this image really is for that mountain in Afghanistan that we are looking for, and is this a higher value target down there. So you can actually go ahead and classify those things, or things like classifying even simplest things like Eiffel Tower, you know, known targets, so, or known um, you know, entities. So there are tons of classification ways to do it. There is a lot of streams processing that leverages this classification. So if we know this is the kind of image that has been rendered out of the, um, uh, from, from that classifier, can we take another action to it and can we kind of you know, extrapolate what we need to do and take the next best action around it? But there are lots of um, you know, open source components that we use. There are lots of internal programs that we have developed that kind of help you analyze this moving imagery or even static image. Like this image could have been you know, uh, frames every five seconds. It could be 24 second frames, but at very high speed. Uh, and another example I can probably give is uh, where we've actually detected the life cycle of different fishes in different maritime locations. And even uh, speaking of maritime, even ships that are kind of going around and submarines that are going around to kind of build patterns on where they are going, what their uh, protect projected destination is, and if they are deviating, uh, you know, from like it's an anomaly where they were supposed to go here, but now they're kind of nearing to a certain different target. But yes, there are tons of ways that we've actually tried to use image and audio processing. Yeah? I have a question I'd like to ask. Uh, do your learning algorithms, uh, do you ever use neural network technology for your learning algorithms, or has uh, that technology fallen by the wayside over the decades? Um, it's still there. It's very much there, and it's mostly used on uh, um, regression, and neural is mostly used on supervised learning, where we try to build models based on predictive models and, and, and those kind of uh, components. But yes, it's, it's definitely there. It's part of... Uh, one of the detection uh, techniques that we still kind of use uh, within even this framework. Is there, is there any attempt to control exfiltration? You uh, may have mentioned that, but I may have missed it. Uh, I'm sorry, information going out? Exfiltration of data. Yes. Once the uh, agent is... Agent is out there. Uh, uh, is there yes. a signature of data that you wish to protect that could be protected from exfiltration? Yes, and uh, we use, uh, there's one example we did for a very large bank, and also it kind of goes back to inside the threat, where um, we, we try, kind of try to identify either through packet or network flows, either just you know, sheer volume that's coming in at a short period of time, so any kind of those anomalies, or things happening outside the normal window, or things that shouldn't have happened. Maybe there's a connection to a certain router that has never happened before, but then now we kind of detect that there is something that's going on, and then suddenly there's a spurt of information that kind of goes out and dies, or maybe there's a bulk of information that's going out. Very recently, about 24 terabytes of data was taken out from DoD, and that's a really good example of uh, detecting high volume of data that's kind of going out in a very short period of time. And those kind of detections are basically exfiltration once the bots have been deployed and uh, you know, intrusion attempts have been successful and now they're trying to gain access to the data. The other example that kind of comes out very common is when employees are trying to steal very high value target information and they're trying to take it and either to intend to sell it out or things like when they land in Wiki, WikiLeaks and things like that. I mean, those kind of information is again. So yes, there are tons of ways where we're trying to use both these kind of uh, Actually, a lot more. There's semi-supervised, and there's unsupervised, and then there's supervised learning algorithms. We use a consortium of all of them, whether they be on the network, whether they be on uh, the endpoints, where you know, like the mobile devices or computer laptop screens. They can, we call them green screen masking. Uh, when information reaches your screen, it kind of gets blocked right there because I didn't have entitlements to look at it. Uh, border protection and those kind of. So there are tons of ways where we're actually blocking traffic, which kind of looks anomalous. Okay, I got a question here. Um, I'm curious now, this is all about the protection of data, et cetera, but are other marketeers jumping on a lot of this as well because they want to find out, like last night, the Orioles and the Nationals, you know, won their, you know, clincher division, you know, thing. Okay, well now, 
all of a sudden at Walmart, whatever, all of a sudden packing their stores filled with, you know, Washington, you know, T-shirts and stuff like that because now all of a sudden I see, you know, this immense spike in information about these types of products and stuff like that. Is that also these algorithms can be used for that as well, I would take it? Unfortunately, yes, the technology is the same that we have and the hackers do. And it's, it kind of goes back to, you know, personal protection of data and how we maintain our privacy. And that's been a huge challenge. And that's why we're trying to stay ahead of the game, that do we understand what they are going to do next and how they are, I mean, they are smart people there and they're dedicated. They're spending months and years trying to learn this. Well, they steal too, but then they also learn by themselves and they're pretty smart in that sense. But yeah, Walmart probably wouldn't do that because it's going to be a huge privacy thing and the 150 billion yeah. thing would go down right away. Uh, my question has to do with uh, the uh, what to do <laughs> is, the, the, is how to treat the systems in, the, in, the, in their development so that what this kind of uh, capabilities that you're talking about are, are really just a, another check and balance instead of, you know, the wall that protects, so the layered security. So what is the, in your mind, the value of good software pract development practices and eliminating as many known uh, software uh, vulnerabilities or weaknesses? And how do we also take into account that people make mistakes. So the problems that the University of Maryland had, and I think maybe Target had, and some of the other companies that have been been hacked, uh, come from a lot of failure to take on good management practices, uh, and it becomes human failure actions and not technology problems. That is very true. And it, you know, this is kind of goes into the bucket of accidental versus intentional. If I'm a developer and an analyst and I have access to the data and I'm really passionate about what I'm trying to develop for the company, I might extract the data and put it on a USB stick and you know, I'm at the airport and I'm sitting at, the, at a bar or maybe at the, at the beach and I'm still coding because that's what I want to do, but accidentally I lose that USB and suddenly the company's data is gone. So, you know, so it can be accidental, but then it can also be something like an intentional breach. So the best practice is around what we kind of tell customers is obviously it goes from, it's very driven from a cost perspective. Production systems are usually much more hardened, much more secure, and they are, the, you know, the, the risk is kind of measured on in terms of uh, how secure those systems are. But kind of replicating that across the enterprise is kind of hard. So what we really want to do is we want to protect information coming in and going out from that secure platform. So any product that tries to extract information out from the system has to go through all the checks that any other system would have to go through, whether it be an intrusion attack or someone else. So if I'm a system admin and I'm supporting my development team, I probably do have the capability to go in and start extracting all the data and give it to my developer because he's probably my you know, brother-in-law or someone. But then that is wrong. From, from at many levels, that's wrong because I'm misusing my power. So it's on the system to kind of go and detect what is this kind of an anomalous activity that's happening which shouldn't have happened in the first place. So most of the things, when we try, what we try to preach is that when data is moving out from your production systems, it should only be visible to folks that have access to that data. So we should mask it, we should anonymize it so it doesn't lose the business context around it, but the data is so useless that even if we lose it, nobody else is going to be able to understand it. So all personally identified information that might be there, any kind of corporate secrets that might be there, anything else that might be hidden within the code, everything is secure because now it has been anonymized. It's been obfuscated from use. And then the second level is obviously encryption, that all the data that's passing between servers, between desktops and to the servers, they have to use known SASL protocols or uh, Spengos or you know, any kind of those technologies like smart cards or HSM. So they have to really follow that, you know, protocol to make sure that the data is protected. I mean, you know, so the risk of losing the data is far greater than, you know, potentially trying to, you know, uh, at many levels. I mean, there's no number we can put at, at the risk that, you know, that brings in. There are no other questions? Thank you very much, sir.